Hi, my name is Maria Bartul and I'm professor of transnational private law at the University of Amsterdam. The focus of my research is the relationship between law and social change. Currently, I'm investigating how private law can contribute to a less extractive economy. Hi, my name is Ingo Fenske. I'm a professor of international law, also at the University of Amsterdam. I have mostly worked on the authority of international courts and tribunals, on theories of legal interpretation, and on international law and inequality. Currently, I'm teasing out international law's contribution to climate injustice. Maria and I want to talk to you today about human rights and global economic law. By global economic law, we mean the public and private law that shapes economy across the different levels of governance. Today, we focus on international trade and private law. However, in our faculty research project, Sustainable Global Economic Law, we also look at European law and at European Union as an important actor in shaping global economic relations. While many people benefit from the global economy every day, current economic practices are not sustainable. They are unsustainable socially and environmentally. The climate crisis and environmental harm are major threats to human rights worldwide. And staggering levels of inequality make it ever more difficult for people to live in a dignified manner. High levels of inequality within and across countries also lead to the fact that the rich and poor have very different views of the world and of the law within it. A trade agreement or a labor contract may look like a wonderful opportunity to some and more likely like something like entrenched domination to others. Trade and private law have a major role to play in the shaping of global economy and its unsustainable practices. Not unlike train tracks or cargo ships, trade and private law are the basic infrastructure of global economy, part and parcel of both its advantages as well as its problems. Well-received thinking about global economic law has above all emphasized the law's benefits. Well, let's look at those first. What are they? Or at least, what are they claimed to be? When we think about human rights in private law, most private lawyers would think of the protection of private property, private autonomy, freedom of contract, yes, that is also part of many constitutions, as well as freedom of occupation or the right to conduct business. Other human rights, such as freedom of religion or freedom of expression, have also had an influence on private legal relations, especially in the process designated as constitutionalization of private law. However, it is private autonomy, freedom of contract and the protection of property that are the foundations of private law and remain so. Historically, these, let's call them uh, private human rights, were intended to empower individuals to conduct their lives in line with their own preferences, shielding them from the unwanted intrusion of states. However, with the spread of incorporation from the end of 19th century, these private rights have expanded their reach to include also corporations. Reliant on the freedom of contract and the freedom of incorporation, a few corporations have succeeded to conquer the world. Expanding their operation all across the globe, growing in size and increasing a global economy, economic output to a significant degree, with benefits for both consumers and economic development. By the same token, these corporations have also succeeded in concentrating large wealth and considerable power. Big multinational uh, corporations today have bigger operating capital or even profits than budgets in many smaller states. Thanks to their economic prowess, they are also able to impose their will not only on their contractual partners, but also on states that are supposed to regulate them. International trade law is concerned with liberalizing international trade. It essentially enlarges the contractual freedoms of companies. Thanks to international trade law and other parts of international law, such as um, the law of investment protection or finance, companies can trade, buy and sell stuff, not only in their local national jurisdiction, but internationally. The underlying idea is to liberalize trade and to allocate resources to the most efficient producer, and that this will increase the size of the pie. 
It should make everyone better off. There is no doubt that not everyone is better off equally. If a particular group of people is stuck with a small piece of the pie or even sees the size of its pie shrink, the trade regime calls on individual states to adjust the situation internally, as it were. This idea is expressed clearly in the title of a recent report that the World Trade Organization co-authored together with the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. The title is Making, an, Making Trade an Engine of Growth for All, the case for trade and the policies to facilitate adjustment. It's all there, right in the title. On the one hand, international law and its institutions seek to generate growth by enabling trade. They increase the size of the pie. On the other hand, domestic law and its institutions are supposed to take care of the distributive consequences by adopting policies to facilitate adjustment. They redistribute the pieces. So on this first take, trade law's relation to human rights is only positive, positive in four ways. First, it links the ideas of private law and expands contractual freedoms globally. Second, it claims to contribute to economic growth and thus to the means for fulfilling human rights. Third, it protects certain human rights, such as the right to property. That link is particularly strong for intellectual property, whose protection is globalized through trade law. Fourth and finally, trade law is often linked positively to human rights through incentives and sanctions. Through so-called human rights clauses, the European Union conditions trade preferences on its trading partners' compliance with the human rights. The track record is at best ambivalent on this count, but the link is there. Now, that all sounds pretty good so far. So what's gone wrong? When, where, and for whom? One way to think about what has gone wrong in private law is to say that thanks to globalization and with the generous help of trade law, private human rights have been taken out of their natural habitat. In constitutional states, both public and private law set, set the conditions on the exercise of private power, be it the conditions on the exercise of bargaining power in contractual context, the obligations to share in their profits through taxation, or limiting the possibility to externalize the environmental costs of business activity. Beyond the state, however, there are few constraints on the exercise of private autonomy and private power. As an example, let's take global value chains. These networks of contracts enable powerful lead firms, often multinational corporations based in Global North, to shift, shift risks and liabilities to their suppliers and suppliers' workers, for instance, uh, often in Global South. For instance, in the pandemic, many such big lead firms could change or cancel their orders for goods and services without incurring any costs, those being left contractually with their suppliers and suppliers' workers in the Global South. At the same time, it is these lead firms that capture most economic benefits or most value, global value chains, uh, out of this cooperation. From each t-shirt that we buy at la large retailers, such as human H&M, uh, only a few cents go to the worker in Global South who has produced the t-shirt, a little more to her factory, but a large proportion of value ends in the pocket of the retailer. What's more, thanks to the doctrine such as privity of contracts, there is very little in terms of legal challenge for human rights violations, violations down the value chains that victims can bring against the lead firm. Thanks to this doctrine, the, the lead firm are bound only to their contractual counterparties, disregarding how much power and influence they exercise over all aspects of production or how far they, their actions have actually contributed to human rights violations. Generally, international trade law and other parts of international law have acted as accelerators and amplifiers in the globalization of private law and the global exercise of private autonomy. As I said at the outset, the trade regime's core function has been to foster and stabilize trade liberalization and to expand contractual possibilities globally. So what's gone wrong? 
Well, not everyone is better off. Trade liberalization's promise turned out to be foul for many. International trade law has been key in cementing a certain distribution of value that is roughly favorable to the center, the global north, and detrimental to the periphery, the global south. The playing field of global competition has namely never been leveled. It has always been rather skewed. The reasons why the haves have come out ahead are certainly many. International trade law has been an important part of it. Through a range of measures that trade law allows, if not fosters, powerful states could ensure that valuable economic activities would continue to be reserved for them. An example of such measures are tariffs, through which cheaper competition can legally be fended off. Many producers in the Global South are locked in a relationship of dependence in which their terms of trade have continuously deteriorated. That is per se nothing new. Dependency theory was particularly prominent in the 1950s, but, and it has lost little of its relevance since then. Rather than increasing the size of the pie, international trade laws function may rather be seen in fostering and further developing an unfair distribution. The effect has been a considerable contribution to rising levels of inequality domestically and even more so globally. The richest 1% globally now hold close to half of the world's wealth and they emit twice as much greenhouse gases than the poorest half of humanity. Global economic law has in short been unsustainable. The point bears repeating because we see that it often gets lost. Our claim is not that unsustainable practices have persisted in spite of the law, but also because of it. The law is also part of the problem, so to speak. Developments in the current COVID pandemic serve as a crisp example. They magnify structural inequalities and relationships of domination and dependence, all solidified in legal arrangements. Inequalities in the distribution of vaccines are just staggering. The example of vaccine patents highlights private legal arrangements in the form of so-called advanced purchasing agreements, as well as the international protection of intellectual property. Rich countries undermined the COVAX initiative, which was set up to manage the acquisition and distribution of vaccines for all states. And instead, vaccine nationalism has been rampant. Vaccine donations are now good and necessary, but such acts of charity must not be mistaken for justice, which would require a transformation of relationships of domination and dependence. A recent standoff about waiving patent protections at the World Trade Organization has once more highlighted discrepancies and concerns about different countries' knowledge, capacities, and their empowerment. I've argued elsewhere that a waiver would not be a panacea, but it should be adopted, not the least because everything else, not adopting it, would signal that private profit trumps considerations of justice. Adopting a waiver would itself only be a tiny adjustment. Like other adjustments, its reach is limited because it essentially stays within the regime rationales that we have outlined above. So what to do? Both Maria and I like to consider ways of breaking with the patterns that have made such considerable contributions to the problems that we are trying to solve. Yes, it's not that we have not tried. With little regulation beyond the state, for a long time, many international organizations have banked on the so-called corporate social responsibility. That is, on the voluntary commitment of multinational corporations to monitor the respect uh, for basic human rights in their supply chains. As one may suspect, these voluntary frameworks have not worked all too well. Today, more and more states are therefore introducing mandatory due diligence legislation, which require companies of certain size to monitor and remove human rights violation, violations from their supply chains. Furthermore, at the United Nations, 
There are currently negotiations ongoing for a binding international treaty that aims to provide access to courts and remedies to victims of human rights violations that took place due to the transnational business activity. What about trade law, Ingo? There are quite classically two main ways of trying to work towards change. One is from within. There would be the way of pushing for a waiver for patents over vaccines and treatments or for a meaningful business and human rights treaty. But in order to push for these changes, one already must accept quite a lot of questionable premises. Another way would be to work from the outside, outside a particular legal regime. There would be to turn to the World Health Organization or the Human Rights Council, for instance, to irritate, in a positive sense, the trade regime and to open it up towards change. Another way would be to step outside the law altogether and put it to the test. To discard the law as ideology or to possibly see that on occasion it does, in whole or in part, do more harm than good. While those are large questions, they can point to more specific ones. If corporate social responsibility and the binding UN treaty still aim to work from the inside, to use Ingo's term, to challenge the private law regime from the outside would require us to ask some very serious questions about the relationship between the public and private power in our constitutional settlements and the desirability of such staggering concentrations of corporate and private uh, wealth uh, and power in the contemporary world. Under what conditions are such concentrations acceptable, if at all? How did we get to, to such concentrations of power in the first place and at whose expense? There is also, finally, another way of looking further on the inside for possibilities of change. Not the inside of any particular legal regime, but inside us. What are the conditions of our beliefs or those who think that all is well and then resist change? Such introspection may alert us to our own biases, to the need to listen to others, and to the values of compassion and empathy in a world that is marred by injustice during overlapping crises.